Hello and welcome to Catholic Unscripted episode 44. I'm Catherine Bennett. I'm Mark Lambert. I'm Gavin Ashenden. Well, we're just coming in with a short video today and then we will be back midweek with a video which we'd like to do a little bit longer on Our Lady and the Saints. So that should come out just before Christmas. But for today, we're just going to have a brief conversation about some of the events in the church, including Cardinal Betu and back to Father Rupnik also. But it's Gaudate Sunday. So we have had lovely masses, each each been to our parish churches today. I've just come back from an evening mass. And um, our priest said a lovely thing, which I thought was really contra to the attitude of the world. So he said, uh, we had quite a lot of young people there. We do have a, it's a huge parish. This is it in, in South London. And we have Indian priests from Kerala and they, there we are, they, beautiful decorations. Thanks, Mark. And our priest was saying, um, a good way to think about joy is the order in which we should prioritise things. So he said, Jesus, others, yourself. And I thought that was lovely to put Jesus first, then others, then yourself. And of course, the world tells us that the world is a bit more like Yodge, yourself, then maybe some others. And if you've got any time left, maybe there's Jesus, but probably just Yo. So joy, Jesus, others and yourself. I thought that was lovely. How was your experience at Gaudate Sunday Mass, Mark? Uh, really lovely. Yeah, it's always a, 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 a joy. And we had a we had um, a beautiful mass. I was just trying to see if I can pull up. Of course, I can't find it now. I'm trying to. I find it really difficult to do two things at once. <laughs> uh, did you, I don't know if you heard that from my wife there in the background. <laughs> what was it? She said it's because you're not a woman. Uh, <laughs> how right is that as well? Right, let me hang on. Hang on, I'm there now. Uh, and, uh, there we go. So that was. That was at our parish today, which was very nice. And that's my little daughter reading at Mass, which was really good. Oh, so, really um, and our homily was about um, focusing on the wrong things, basically. It was quite good. It was about, uh, you know, the fact that we get, we're all bound up with the preparation and, uh, thinking about all the wrong things rather than thinking about what it means for Jesus to come at Christmas. We're all concerned with what we're going to get from Father Christmas, etc. So, yeah, that was that. That's lovely. We, um, we'll talk about Mary, as I said, uh, in a bit, in a bit, bit of a deeper exploration in a video upcoming before Christmas, but lovely idea of Mary carrying the light of the world so mary we'll, we'll talk about her being the ark of the covenant so mary carrying the light so we'll discuss that further uh in a few days but gavin how was your experience of gaudate sunday i think one of the loveliest things was we had yet another woman person become a catholic and was received into the church today so i my parish here is on the borders of wales in the north it's a very quiet place <laughs> and yet uh, in this tiny little church with not a very big congregation, we constantly have people knocking on the door and saying they want to become Catholics. And it, it happens so regularly and frequently. And it's real, it's a wonderful joy, really. It's a, 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 a stream turning into a river of people. So that was one of the most exciting things that happened today. That's, a, that's about as exciting as it gets, isn't it? That's fantastic. Great to hear that, especially where you are, because outside of London, there's you know, there is a crisis really in terms of, of numbers, but it's growing, which is wonderful. Um, Mark, a quick question for you before we um, have maybe a little bit of comment for people wondering what's happening with uh, Cardinal Betu in Rome. Um, but we've had somebody ask about gluten free hosts. So uh, is there anything you can say about that? Are these uh, some people may be gluten intolerant and ask for a host to be gluten free and then receives that? How, what, what's the teaching on that? Well, the, like all of the sacraments, we rely on matter and form, and uh, matter is what they're made of, and form is the words that are said. And so, if you have a gluten-free host, it's not valid sacramental material. So, you, there's no such thing, basically. Um, but you can have a low 
gluten like some but you have to have it agreed by the ordinary by the bishop or whatever that you can you can use those it's so serious in fact that you can't be admitted to the priesthood if you're gluten intolerant believe it or not <clears throat> and i know like this is this culture that we've got isn't it that's uh we have to you know oh, but that shouldn't stop you from being part of something i can remember being on the uh, being on a committee for the diocese once, and someone said, you know, like that they like they were talking. It was talking about the validity of marriage, and um, the you know that marriage has to be consummated in order to be valid. And one of the people on the thing said, "Oh, it's such a shame because what if you were disabled or you couldn't, you know?" And like the, it's one of those situations. Where it's like, well, you know, if you're blind, you can't drive a car, can you? <laughs> You might really want to drive a car, but you can't, you know. So, yeah, I did actually say that in the meeting, and I don't think it went down too well. It's like, you know. We do live in an age where it's like we just have this expectation that we can do anything and, and don't seem to accept any limitation whatsoever. Um, sorry, Gavin, yes. I wanted to join in. I'm, I'm in the middle of trying to write an article for the Catholic Herald on transhumanism and the whole trans crisis and the incarnation. And one of the things that's coming through as I think about it is how important matter is. So this is bouncing off what Mark was saying. How, how, um, and I think, too, somebody found it difficult that Mark was drinking a glass of wine. And one of the things they want to say is that Jesus, that Jesus was extremely was home extreme. in, in um, social occasions where there wasn't enough wine, he made more wine. Um, but thinking about matter, it's, it's the notion that in the whole trans debate, that matter or one's, one's given sex is something dispensable, that what goes on inside our head is more important than the material <laughs> world being born into. And I think somebody said rather sweetly, I'm not sure who it was, that, that, that matter matters to God. He made a lot of it and he uses it. And perhaps most importantly, I mean, he uses it for so many wonderful things, for, for, for music and lovemaking and food and wine and our, our bodies, which are wonderful and amazing things, the universe. And he chose to enter matter himself in the incarnation. I think one of the things that as a Christian, we spend quite a lot of time trying to make ourselves a bit more Gnostic and, uh, and, and attacking matter or containing it or fighting it. There's a balance to be had between repudiating matter where we become addicted to it uh, and accepting matter as one of the joyful places where God is very busy at work. And I think in terms of both the way in which we receive God in the Eucharist and the gift of wine, but also our bodies and our sexuality, our, our, our given sex, the fact that we are men and women, this, this matters to God, matters, and we need yeah, to find simple. a balance, as in so many things, with uh, struggling against matter where it overcomes us, and um, celebrating it and accepting it as God's instrument for us uh, when we're not struggling with it. That's not, um, just uh, between me and you now. I don't, like that's not transhumanism, though, is it? That's I don't know if you, uh, whether that was a mistake or like transhumanism is the is allowing technology to change our cognition and yes the, the article that i'm writing starts with the trans thing and then moves on to transhumanism as the far oh. extreme of the ideology that we're dealing with so it's there's a there's a scale so, uh, ideologically beginning with transhumanism but uh, coming down and expressing itself at the moment in the whole trans debate which if you like are the foothills of transhumanism because in these foothills of the trans issue is the repudiation of our bodies, for swapping one body for another. Um, and once you begin to diminish the acceptance of the body, the, the philosophical trajectory of that is that bodies don't matter at all. They're dispensable. Mm. And that's where it begins to move towards. Well, it's, yeah, it's body. even worse, isn't it? Because it's not really swapping one body for another body, is it? It's pretending. Yeah. That's like right. that. Yes. Who was it? Murphy was on, that was on Twitter today, wasn't it? That uh, The Reverend Brett Murphy, who's left the Anglican church, yes. got into loads of trouble for, <laughs> there was like, you, what was that guy? He was a, he wasn't a priest in the Anglican church, was he? He was a, some kind of an ordained minister though, wasn't he? And he, who then said he was a lady and Brett, uh, Reverend Brett Murphy said, he's a bloke and 
basically got told off by the Anglicans. I thought that was really interesting. This is a senior Anglican cleric uh, in in Manchester's diocese, where the bishop is liberal. And what Brett Murphy was concerned about was that he thinks that the establishment is is preparing to foist this uh, woman, this this I, this ma- person who was born as a man but who now identifies as a woman, and to produce the first trans Anglican bishop. And Brett Murphy was saying, because of the platform that's been given to her by by the establishment, um, that actually we ought to realise that this is this is a man born a man is a man biologically a man. The mm-hmm. fact he identifies as a woman doesn't make him. A woman and and shouldn't be foisted on the church as a bishop, but this has sent the Anglican hierarchy into paroxysms of fury, <laughs> and so they've been attacking him for telling the truth about this man, and his response was to say, well, in that case, I shall leave the Church of England and join the Free Church of England, like Calvin Robinson did, and they said, no, no, not so fast. We have four disciplinary charges against you. We want to make stick against you. And he said, Tara, I've gone. I don't care. They said, nevertheless, we're going to go through this and try you in absentia. The whole thing shows quite how how hysterical they are about trying to defend the untruthness of trans. Yeah, yeah that's what I think. That's... Is not standing up for truth is is just ridiculous, isn't it? Mm. Yeah, if we can't, all... if if you can't rely on the on the Christian Church to say what's true and what's not true, then why on earth would you be involved with it? And uh, that struck me as very, very strange and worrying. But then I think that's one way to discern. Um, I think sometimes in, we don't need to get ourselves hot and bothered about uh, trying to draw people into the church because they'll recognise truth and they'll be brought to truth. And being brought to truth and the fullness of truth means that we'll have uh, a lot more Sundays like Gavin's Gaudate Sunday as people become Catholic when they realise that there's the fullness of truth. So... Um, in a sense, you think, well, isn't it awful and isn't it a shame? But it exposes the the, the falsehood. Or well, there was a brilliant um, interview with the Coalition for Marriage, I think it's called, and uh, Ian Paul. You know Ian Paul? So Ian Paul is an evangelical preacher in the like, but he's quite high up in the Church of England. He's on the like, he's on the, he's in a member of the Synod and. He did a yeah. really good interview, um, which I've been trying to get Jules Gomez to pick over with me on, you know, like if I did a, a video on it, because it, it, in it he's sort of saying that the church, that the Anglican Church says that um, that they've got a there's a difference with the rule of law, Gavin. Is that that, that that like the law is part of Anglican writ in some way? So they're basically saying that the to be a, that the Anglican Church can't contradict what the you know teaching biblical teaching or whatever and the, or the bishops can't contradict church teaching and that's basically what's going on at the moment with this thing we're blessing um mm. same-sex couples which was something that happened today wasn't it and i saw you posted uh you know two women or something blessed <laughs> it just gets beyond it. it's like they're trying to do the most extreme version or the most and when i say extreme what i mean is the most offensive to god or the most opposite sort of position that they can possibly get would you agree that i think the conservatives in the church of england have sadly lost lost the battle ian paul's a very clever and a very good man and has been fighting a rearguard action for a long time um he, um he i'm not his favorite person because he hates the idea that i present which is that the battle is long lost in the church of england and however much competent and clever and good people like Ian fight it, they're not going to win. What, what you've been describing is, a, is, is a, a legalistic attempt to look at the intermingling of church law and the law of the land because they're conjoined uh, under the authority of parliament and to suggest that the church can't do things independently of parliamentary law. But I, I think it's a... Uh, I don't think they're going to get anywhere. Um, it's not as if suddenly all the bishops in the Church of England are going to throw up their hands and say, oh dear, we better slap our wrists. We would no idea that we've offended a, against the constitutional nicety. We'll change our minds and go back to believing the Bible. It's just not going to happen. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, Ian's trying to make them accountable for it. And he's uh, he's a very competent theologian and a very good biblical scholar. Um, but but I, I'm afraid, I think, uh, as you quite rightly say, today was the first day Two lesbian clergy came out dancing all over Twitter, declaring their unbridled passion and love for each other. 
uh, and in the name of in the name of, of, of Christ in the New Testament, it's so far removed from what he came to do to our humanity that uh, if it wasn't so sad, it would be laughable, but it really is quite tragic. Mm. Yeah. Well, to, to two tragic cases in our own Catholic Church and the, the news that Cardinal Betu has um, been sentenced for his dodgy dealings in Vatican finances and so on and... Uh, Cardinal Rupnick, sorry, not Cardinal, Father Rupnick, um, the Order of Nuns that he founded has been uh, dis dispensed with, uh, dissolved by Pope Francis. So um, what do we know about Cardinal Betu, Mark? Well, it, you know, this is so, it's been going on for so long and it's so complicated. And I think we were saying before that, I, you know, I don't really feel hugely competent in even speaking about it because the trial has been going on for so long. And although I did write some bits on it much earlier on, you know, like it's been going on for years. Um, and so there's quite a bit of it that I sort of remember, but I, you know, like now it's what's extraordinary about it is, so there's loads of really like, you know, um, complex ins and outs, twos and fro's and one thing or another. Some of the most interesting bits were that, um, so going way back to about 2004, 2005, when Cardinal Pell was in charge of the Vatican Bank and I met with Cardinal Pell, um, he was over for something and I had a little chat with him and I said to him, how's it all going? And he said, oh, it's an, you know, an awful mess. He said, but we're getting there, we're sorting it out. And what he'd done was he'd, he'd organised for an independent review of dealings within the Vatican Bank. And then that basically, very shortly after that, was was quashed. And it was quashed by this cardinal, Cardinal Betu. He wasn't a cardinal at the time. And um, then very spuriously, Cardinal Pell, there were some charges that came up against him and there was some money that changed hands between Rome and Australia. And that, that is, doesn't seem to ever have been answered, what that was all about. But the next thing, Cardinal Pell went off to face charges which he eventually overcame in Australia. Um, so there's a so there's a complication there, but basically Betchu was the one who stopped the auditors, Price, I think it was Price Waterhouse Cooper, from actually doing their work and from getting to the bottom of what was going on. And then the Pope seemed to back Betchu because he made him a cardinal in a consistory. Um, and the Betu seemed to be the Pope's man, you know, he was sort of backing him. And I wrote and I wrote a blog about it at the time saying, you know, the Pope has backed the wrong horse yet again. <laughs> it seemed really obvious that there was something dodgy going on. And this seems to be a hallmark of Francis's papacy that he doesn't really care how obvious his backing of spurious, you know, nefarious individuals is. He's quite happy to go ahead and do it in the full blare of the limelight. And then after a little while, we removed Betu's cardinalate. He took away his privileges and then he gave it back to him again. So, there, I mean, it's very difficult not to think that there was some sort of dialogue going on, which was about, you know, you if you say this and you say that. And this went on in the trial. So I'm not just making this up, right? This went on in the trial because... Um, Betu was basically saying that the Pope, so he even recorded phone calls between him and the, himself and the Pope. So, so trying to make out that the Pope knew about everything he was doing. <clears throat> and then, you know, it turned out that like the Pope was basically coming out and saying, Oh, I didn't know anything about any of it. It was all very cloudy and dodgy. So I think like Gavin and I were saying, is this Pope Francis trying to, um, demonstrate that he's cleaning up the Vatican's finances, or so, which was one of the big things that he said he was going to do. But then when Powell actually seemed to be doing it, he seemed to put a, a roadblock in, in the way of that. Um, and instead, you're left with this situation where it looks very much like, I mean, I, ca I can't see how the Pope comes out of this in, in any good light at all. He just looks to me like he's right in the middle of it all. Would you say, Gav? Yes, I, I I think it's difficult. Um, that I do. My my first instinct is that um, Betsy was appointed to do what the Pope said he would do, which is clean up the finances. But as you've so clearly demonstrated, that hasn't happened, <clears throat> and it looks like he's a fall guy. 
Um, and, and one of the things his lawyers have said is that they've made it clear that he hasn't received any money himself, although he seems to have sent a certain amount of money to his relatives, uh, if that's true. Anyway, he's going to appeal, so we won't know for a while. But if Pope Francis was staking his reputation on clearing up the Vatican finances, um, the trap that was laid for Pell and the complexity of what's happened to Betu don't suggest that there's a happy conclusion that anyone can take joy in. So in terms of the three things that, that constantly bedevil the spiritual journey, the abuse of power, the abuse of sex and the abuse of money, the score isn't very good at the moment. Yeah, well, that you know when Mark says he doesn't know much about something, that's a, a different level to the rest of us. So that's Mark's version of I don't know anything about this, which is still a lot more than most. Um, and then this order that Rupnik founded has been dissolved, this, again, this sort of cleaning up. But it's, you know, it really seems like blaming the victims, doesn't it? Dissolving the order that uh, of these nuns that were horribly... Um, abused by uh, Father Rupnik. Yeah, well, that's. I mean, to me, it looks like bury the evidence and and blame the victims. And you know, Father Rupnik has, has no. There's nothing happens to him. He gets away with absolutely everything. It's just mm. unbelievable. And we go back to Cicero. You know, I keep going back to Cicero with it for my friends. Everything for my enemies. Well, Cicero says justice, but not even in Francis's case, yeah. not even justice. And he just, you can't help get away from this feeling that he usurps this power like a South American dictator. That's how it feels to me, um, in the most dreadful way. And, and these are out in the open examples where it's very difficult for normal people, even people who are following what's going on like us, let alone just regular people, to get any sense of how this could possibly, how there's any justice on offer for anyone. I have a few people writing to me saying, "We, I used to watch what you did, and I'm not going to anymore because you've been mean to Pope Francis and this is not the action of a faithful Catholic. I've been thinking about it quite carefully. We're back to Jesus being the way, the truth and the life. I think it would be demeaning to Catholics to hide or dissemble corruption at the heart of the institution. I, one of the things that has made me a Catholic is my my love of the idea of the papacy. And I'm perfectly aware that the people who've held the office have been very seriously flawed, and we have one of those at the moment. I think the more you love the idea of the papacy, the more you feel very strongly that if the, an incumbent fails it, you're entitled to say so in order to keep the truth of of the, the sanctified idea. And the trouble is that Francis does seem to be failing the virtues of the papacy. I, I don't understand um, the complexities of financial sophistication, but I do understand that if a priest is part of a community with 40 nuns in it and he sexually abuses 20 of them, uh, and then the answer is to close down and stop all 40 having any, uh, any existent institutionally, that the people in charge of that are being profoundly corrupt. And that particular responsibility comes back to Pope Francis. He's the one who appears to have both excommunicated and then rescinded the excommunication uh, to, to demand action happen and then to oversee no action happening. And I think in the Rupnik case, it's one of the clearest examples of serious corruption in the church. And I don't understand how it can be that the Pope can preside over the particular circumstances where nobody is held to account. It's the silence as well, isn't it? Which is interesting, I think. It's not like they're trumpeting, like this stuff with Rupnik. There's no communication about it. It all just is like silent running. It all goes below the radar. Well, they're trying to hush it up. Exactly. That's what I mean. Is it, how, how else are you supposed yeah. to read it? You know? <laughs> I can understand people's concerns about about how we manage discussing our Holy Father and even to call the church an institution falls short somehow it's not an institution like any other earthly institution and we have to be mindful of our place and what our purpose is and I uh, so why is it important so let's take a look at Ed Condon who's a who's a um a, a canon lawyer and he was quite critical of Betu and got horrible abuse from Betu uh, saying, I'm glad that you're bringing all this up because 
Jesus says people will attack you for being truthful and, you know, using scripture to quote against uh, um, Ed Condon. And all the time Ed was right and he's been vindicated. But he went through the same sort of thing that the cardinals were attacking him. People were writing to him and saying, who do you think you are attacking a cardinal? So it's a difficult one. I can understand why people have concerns and say, who do you think you are? But I think this case shows why it's important, as long as it's done charitably, to, to you know, bring to light that filth which does lie. And this, this doesn't mean the church is only filthy. It's beautiful. It's Holy Mother Church. It's because she's so beautiful. It's like you can't sully something. Uh, you can't make mud dirty because it's already oh, mud. Good. But you can make the church dirty. You can make something beautiful filthy because it's so beautiful. And so, therefore, it's just bringing to light. Please, Gavin, go on. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Um, it's always hard to know when each of us is going to finish a sentence, um, uh, especially me. My sentence is going on a very long time. <laughs> I, I, um, I, I'm going to have to edit I, out I, the eye roll, sorry. I, I, do, I, do, <laughs> I don't, don't think you should edit out an eye roll. I, I, I do. Th people will say I would say this, wouldn't I? Of course. But some of my correspondents who've held me to account for being mean to the Pope. When I've said to them, look, here are the reasons why I'm supremely dissatisfied. There was a very powerful speech given by the author of um, the book called The Dictator Pope, whose name I'm afraid I've forgotten. Henry Sawyer. Latin Mass yeah, thank you. It's given at the Latin Mass Society, and it's online. And when I, when I read it again, uh, it, it reinforced my, my, my deep sorrow about the way in which... Um, Pope Francis has a background of corruption and bullying that hasn't changed but has deepened. And so when people have written to me saying, you're not being nice and you're not being a faithful Catholic, I said, but here are the reasons why I find this present papacy really problematic and frankly, personally wounding. I didn't want to become a Catholic at a time when the, the papacy was at one of the lowest ebbs it's been for hundreds of years. But they don't answer you. They just They just say, no, no, we don't accept what you've said. Um, and I think there's a certain naivety about. Um, <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> it was a nice meeting. Well, you are the only one out of the three of us who've actually encountered him and met him face to face. And I remember, um, yes. you know, Archbishop Cordiglione is, is a great hero of mine. And um, I had an opportunity to talk to him for some time. And he said to me, <laughs> Pope Francis was a very cordial, you know, very amicable person to be in the company of. So, um, you know, it's, I think it's important that we met. There, are, there is that dimension to it as well, isn't there? Uh, we tread this very difficult line between not judging each other in the terms of condemning each other, but nonetheless being accountable to each other for, for good judgment, for discretia, which is a gift of the Holy Spirit. Um, I would just like to tell people that nobody would like to be fonder of the Pope than I would, uh, or few people would like to be fonder of the Pope would. than I would. <laughs> but but I'm I'm unable to because of because of the facts I see them, and I think most of the time the people who uh, say you're behaving badly because you're criticising the Pope seem to me to have be reacting instinctively and I would say naively and without any information. When I say, well, look, here's the information, what should we do with it? Show me how I should have a different view given the facts that have been put on the table. They don't say anything, which is why I think they're underinformed. So it's not for loving, it's not for lack of loving the papacy. It's quite the opposite. It's because it's so deeply important that when somebody scandalizes the church with the with, with their behavior falling so far short of what the office requires that it's a source of great pain and disappointment. Mm. It is incumbent upon us, though, isn't it, to find the good and not only zone in on, on the bad, because there is a lot of ambiguity and we always point to it. But there are times when Pope Francis has spoken clearly, but also quite beautifully on, on a number of occasions, um, perhaps more in the things he says than, than in some of the things he writes, which I know, Mark, you struggled with. But but I think it's incumbent upon us to to try and find some of the the things he says and does that are beautiful and true and good because there are it to give a to give a, the impression that he's wholly bad. I think 
leads to um, people to um, start throwing around accusations of the Antichrist and, and, and being tempted to set evocantism, which is which is divisive and it's not it's not healthy. And I think I think we have a responsibility in that regard to 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 show which I think we try to do at times uh, to try and show that he is the valid pope and has made a, a number of good contributions. I think I'm looking right, at Gavin's time face. To go off, <laughs> no, I think so. I I, I remember uh, G.K. Chesterton said, you know, if you love something, you want to defend it, and so that's why we, are, you know, I love the papacy. It's extraordinarily brilliant thing. It's the thing that makes it that makes Catholicism stand out, and 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 so I feel like Pope Francis is doing a tremendous disservice to that papacy. You can't argue. That he hasn't caused massive amounts of confusion. I'm completely prepared to pick anything decent that he says and hold it up and say, "Oh, thank God for that." But I think, on yeah. balance, he's a bad pope. I don't, you know, I'm yeah, sorry, balance, but we've all said it. On balance, yeah. he's a bad pope. I'll say it. You say it. And he is doing a great disservice to the papacy. But there are some things he's said and done that are not. Yeah, occasionally he says something even that's even that sort of. Yeah, no, yeah. but even though they're few, we 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 have. Uh, it's only, I think uh, a responsibility to 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 mention those or to bring them. To it's life. only what we know. The bad stuff as well is only what we know. And how much do we actually know? You know, I, I, I don't think we know half of what's really going on behind the scenes. And Cardinal Betu is a really good example. Yeah. You know, of the stuff that we we don't even know. You know, there's loads of yeah. stuff going on, and that's the real damage that's being done. You know. But this is also part of the problem of the age in which we live, Gavin, which is that, um, you know, we, we live in a time where everyone knows everything about what everybody's doing all around the world. And we wouldn't have known what was happening in Rome, what was happening at the Vatican, uh, 50, even 50 years ago. And in a way that forces us to be more mindful of our own. Now, there's a good and a bad to everything, but of our own parish life, our own home life, our own school life. And that that community of parish home and school would have been the focus and now it's you know globalized everything is is international and and so part of the part of that's good because it, it does help bring things to light but it also makes us sometimes over analyze and 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 over emphasize things that are happening far away that that can interfere with our own striving for holiness in our everyday lives well, yes, I don't disagree with you. Everything you said is true. I'm just trying, I think, probably defend myself in the sense that I was thinking, what are the good things I like about Pope Francis? Because to begin with, I liked a lot about him. I liked the fact he took public transport. I liked his humility. I liked the fact he took cheap cars. I liked the fact that he took the time to phone up people and cancel newspapers. There was a humanity about him that I, I liked very much. Now, what do you say? So let's put that on the good side. Then I was horrified when I saw him slap an elderly lady in St. Vatican Square in a fit of what looked like, to the camera, serious peak. I was horrified when a black cardinal approached him uh, and he pulled his ring away from him uh, and turned his back on him for, no, for reasons that weren't at all obvious. Well, I was Kevin, horrified when people... You can't, know, you can't know that that's because... No, I don't know. No. You, you can't I, say I, he slapped a woman which was awful and then he met another 10 million people and didn't slap any of them. I'm saying exactly that. But look at things like the. This. What was the day On when the other he? Hand, nor do you know. But you remember that time when he he was in the. He decided to take his ring to pull his ring away from. There was a big long queue of people in the Vatican, and it was just. I don't know if that's ever that, happened yes. before, but it was, and and it was just awful. The optics were just dreadful, and it's like. If you didn't want people to kiss your ring, then just have a little word with the Kamaleng, you know, with someone beforehand and say, the master of ceremonies or something, and say, oh, look, you know, my hand's a bit sore or something. And, and everyone would have been cool with it. But instead of that, he decided to do this horrible thing. And it's stuff like that. You'd, like the optics yeah, are I, just diabolical. <laughs> even you saying that, the optics, the optics are what we've been, um, uh, brought, what's been brought to our attention. So, I, look, none of this is to say Pope Francis is, the, is wonderful and a great writer and a wonderful Pope and a bridge builder um, and, and, you know, 
encourages all liturgy. We know, he said himself in a Mexican interview just last week, I'm a difficult person. I'm a difficult person. My bishops have a lot to put up with. He himself would say this. I suppose I'm saying we, for every slap uh, and for every aggressive thing or for every act of racism, as Gavin intimated, we might... I we can't might, believe um, we're saying this out of the boat. I, I, I hadn't actually, would have I said actually, it about Benedict. But the optics, of what, the optics that I liked of him at the beginning... Were, were plus things and then there were optics at the end which were minus things and I was describing mm -hmm. those optics what I wanted to say was the point that perhaps you made better than I did which is in the end we've, we're just left with optics but the difficulty is you can't you can't promote the good ones if you're not going to deal with the bad ones and you can't deal with the bad ones unless you're going to also deal with the good ones and the difficulty we have is that if we're left with optics what do we do but the problem with being a pope in the public eye is you're judged by a higher standard of optic than most other people. And so I don't know why he slapped people and pulled his ring away and behaved in a, in a way that appeared petulant any more than I know uh, why he, whether he meant what he said when he cancelled his newspapers and phoned people up in hospital and act of, of, of personal kindness because those were promoted by his underlings in a way that made it look a little bit like private acts put out in the public for public consumption to improve his optics. So the difficulty is we can't make a judgment and yet we're left with the humanity, with our own macular humanity of having to make decisions. The trouble is, he, more than anybody else uh, that I can think of in that role, his optics of confusing and made it difficult. I don't remember Benedict giving us such trouble or John Paul giving us such trouble. I don't no, remember I any other Pope ca ca causing us the difficulty of making assumptions through the optics. And you're quite right. Uh, I'm perfectly aware that, 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 that my judgment may be really badly flawed, but I wish the optics weren't so challenging. Yeah, but also no other Pope has lived in the internet age with the, the fast media that we have now, the new media. Only uh, uh, the Pope Benedict was at the just at the beginning point of that. And and this is the first Pope. So you couldn't really make a fair comparison. And and of course, that isn't to say he's he's uh, the same as Benedict and, and John Paul, but um, it's it's not it's not a, a sort of level playing field in that respect. But we know what he said on the plane when Pope Benedict was in the news, it was because he said something orthodox, wasn't it? You know, I can remember the thing when he went to Africa about condom use and, all, you know, this was the sort of thing that was coming up. It's just not the same sort of stuff. Like Pope Francis is saying stuff that's against the faith and that's why he's in the news, you know, literally contradicting the faith. And like with Scalfari, for example, like, and it's not just one thing, it's loads and loads and loads of stuff you know, comments to journalists about coprophagia or whatever, you know, like just uh, yeah. just a tr appalling stuff for the Pope. We're here, we're three really knowledgeable and faithful Catholics, and we're appalled by it. Like, and we don't want to be. We, we're on the Pope's side. And that was the thing that I always said about Francis from the beginning, is that he seemed to be going after the people who were on his side, the, the traditionalists or the you know, the Orthodox or the people who really cared about the faith and about the papacy. And it just seemed to me that the least he could do as the Pope would to be nice to the people who really believed in the Catholic faith. And instead, he has consistently and constantly attacked those people and marginalised them and tried to introduce all this, you know, and in the, in the guise of being like Jesus uh, meeting with sinners and you know that's sort of the the spin that's put on it but that's not what he's doing at all because he, it's not like Jesus always called those people to repentance that's and we even had it this week with Cardinal Fernandez god help us I mean you've I've never seen anyone as unfit for office as that fellow really is and now they've put him in charge of the dicastery for the doctrine of the faith it's obvious why just to roll steam roll through all the rubbish that Pope Francis wants to get through or whatever. And this week he even said that, didn't he? He, he set up a, he said the whole pericope of the, uh, did you see this? It was really interesting because it was about um, the gospel where Jesus meets the woman being stoned for adultery. And he says that the whole pericope is, you know, whoever is without sin cast the first stone, it's not go and sin no more. I just was like, what? Mm. Like setting up a false dichotomy in scripture. 
what could be where's division from division diablos you know it's from the yeah. devil yeah. go away yeah. Fernandez, and stop yeah. talking rubbish you know or go and learn something you know really frustrating and everyone it, like this is the thing is everyone who is a, is a catholic is saying the same stuff so it's not just us you know everyone with a little bit of theology to, you know, from the greatest professor or all the clergy I know, everyone can see that the emperor's got no clothes. So if you're defending it at this point, sorry, but you're a lunatic. Yeah, good. Right. On that note, thank you very much for watching. <laughs> we'll be back. <laughs> Have a joyful Sunday. We'll be back. Um, oh, you can't leave it on. there. We have to say something else. Oh, we'll be back. <laughs> we'll be back with more um, um, on Our Lady and the Saints, which I hope will be very edifying and a lovely episode to watch. But thank you both for ranting. <laughs> it's so good to be with you uh, this Gaudate Sunday. Right, I'm Catherine Bennett. I'm Mark Lambert. I'm Gavin Ashenden. Pray for Pope Francis. Pray for us. <laughs> <laughs>